This game is without a doubt the most controversial game of Alareza Farouge's career, and not because of what happens on the board, because, but because of what happens off the board. I want to walk through this game and the drama that unfolded and its impact to this very day. This is the Tata Steel Masters of 2021. His opponent is Radislav Wodacek. And join me for this very intense uh, game and uh, experience for Alareza. Welcome to Chess Dog. My name is John Montgomery. Let's jump right in. In this game, Alareza has the white pieces. He starts with knight f3, d5, g3, and I actually went over this opening in my previous video. So if you want to look over the details of the opening, you can check out uh, that, that uh, previous video. Knight d7, d4, knight b6, knight c3, knight f6, a4, a5, bishop g2, h6 to tuck away the bishop, the bishop goes to f5, knight h4, bishop h7, and uh, we talked about in the previous video how the e4 pawn break is the main pawn break here for white, but Alareza finds a new way because you can't play that right now. f4, and then after e6, f5. And he is already in this very original position putting pressure on black's e6 square and his center. Black is two moves away from castling, and Alareza is already castled. Bishop to e7 is played. If black takes on f5, the knight takes f5. White has a well-placed knight, and uh, the, if he takes with the bishop, he'll have the two bishops. This breaks with e4. He's just doing better. So bishop to e7, bishop to h3 continues to pile up on the e6 pawn. Queen to d7 to defend it. Queen to d3 to back up that f5 square. Queen to c6. Now knight to b5. That knight on b5, very well placed, aims at the c7 pawn. He could play bishop to f4 and pile up on that pawn. If black were to castle long, the knight a7 check would fork the king and the queen. The knight goes to c4, the bishop goes to f4, and so now he takes that knight and interposes it because white was threatening knight takes c7 check. Queen to e3. Putting pressure up the half open. Well, it's not really half open, but the queen's in front of his own pawn, so it's almost as if it's a half open e file, aiming at the black king, keeping unbearable pressure on black. Knight to c4, queen to d3, bishop to d6. Now black gives up the two bishops uh, instead of re repeating moves. Perhaps if he repeated moves, he feared queen to e3, knight c4, and queen to f3, which uh, for allows Feruja to avoid the repetition of moves. He would not have played into a repetition here. Knight takes bishop. Knight takes knight. Bishop to e5. Now, black is not playing poorly. Um, he does have this e4 square, and his two knights are aiming at that square. Knight d to e4. Queen to a3. And what that does is prevent long castling, or short castling. Black can't castle kingside because he would have to castle over check with the queen aiming at f8, and that's, would be, that would be illegal. Queen to d7, c4, opening up lines. He's got the two bishops, so you want to open up lines. Black's king can't castle, so you want to open up lines. c6, he wants to keep them closed. If he takes here, then just rook a to c1, and uh, the position is opening up favorably for white. So he plays c6, fe6, fe6, and now that e6 pawn is a, a permanent target. cd5, and he takes with the knight. Bishop to g2. Um, what, a better idea here, a computer idea, was actually knight to g2, with the idea of playing that knight g2 to f4 and piling up on the e6 pawn. After bishop to f5 uh, to defend it, then bishop takes, takes knight to h4, where the bishop is aiming at g7, the knight is aiming at f5, and uh, black has to lose material in this position. Instead, Ferruja plays bishop to g2, knight to d2, rook f to c1 making sure that knight doesn't jump into c4, forking the queen and the bishop. Rook to f8, knight to f3, knight takes, bishop takes f3. So now, Wodacek does what we call castling by hand. This is when you actually move your pieces into a castled position, but you do it step by step artificially instead of in one move with the castling move. He plays king to f7, and you'll see if he plays king to g8, his pieces will be in the castling position. He just moved his pieces there. E4, kicking the knight away. Two bishops and a nice pawn center. White is doing well. Knight to B4. 
queen to e3, re-centralizing the queen. And here we have a sequence of moves where each side sort of has little sort of pinprick threats against pawns and squares for an extended period of time. One attacks, one defends. Okay, he plays king to g8, completing the artificial castling. Rook to c3, rook a to d8, h4. Wants to play h5, lock in that uh, weak g6 square. b6, black would like to play c5 and undermine that center of white. Bishop to e2, the bishop reroutes. You can see how the bishop on c4 would be aiming at the e6 weakness and the king at g8. That would be a strong square for the bishop. Queen goes to e7. Again, we're preparing that c5 idea. Bishop to g4 goes back, aiming at the e6 pawn. Queen to f7 with threats down the f-file. I say with threats, not yet, but potential threats down the f-file. h5, locking in that g6 square. Queen to e7. Uh, he might be able to play the queen to g5 if the queen moves from e3. Rook a to c1. Piling up on the, uh, the c6 pawn and threatening an exchange sacrifice. For example, if black were to try to fork the rooks, then rook takes c6. And if knight takes c1, bishop e6 check, king h8, queen c1. And this, game, this is completely over. The extra exchange doesn't matter. Those two pawns and those bishops are dominating. The computers give, I think, plus five in this position. And after bishop takes pawn, queen takes h6 check. The g-pawn is pinned by the bishop at e5. And after the bishop comes back, rook to c7. And obviously, black's position completely collapses. So instead, he plays queen to e8, adding another defender to the c6 pawn. Bishop to c7. A double attack of the rook and the pawn at b6. But he still has to worry about the knight a2 fork. That does still, it's still, still on the board. So after rook d7, bishop takes b6. Knight to a2, rook takes c6, and the computers here prefer bishop to a5. Um, you give up the exchange, but you grab the a pawn, and now you've got that very nice passed a a4 pawn. Instead, Ferruja takes on c6, knight c1, rook takes c1 here. He could play bishop e6 check, but after takes, 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 rook c1 and queen to g4, and black's active pieces actually compensate for uh, being material down. So instead of taking the pawn at e6, he goes ahead and captures the knight at c1. Rook to b7, bishop to c5, attacking the rook at f8. The rook gets out of the attack. b3, the pawn is now defended laterally by the queen, and also it could support a bishop sitting at the c4 square. Rook f to c7, rook to e1, by defending the e4 pawn a second time, that allows his queen to move away if she needs to. Rook to c6, bishop e2, again, pre preparing that shift back to c4. He's reconsidering it. Queen to b8, bishop to b5. It's the rook. Rook to c8, now bishop to c4. Threatening bishop takes e6, check. So you see every move has a little threat. Um, and so now, as this game is going on, there's another drama off the board. Um, as it turns out, Alareza is playing for a tie in his total score, but they have this really odd tie break system called Sonborn Son Burger, and I'm not even going to get into how complicated it is. It's kind of ridiculous, to be honest, uh, but it's a tie break system that it uses a little formula to determine whose wins have more, valuable, uh, more value than someone else's. Now, let me say something about tie breaks like this. If you're in some big weekend Swiss in Las Vegas with 1,200 players, these are useful. They help, right? You got so many people, you need these little tie break systems to help you deal with the places. But if you are in a closed, elite super tournament with a 10 or 12 invited super grandmasters, tie breaks must be done on the board. There's not going to be no no formulas can can be used. They must play, even if it's a shorter time control, even a blitz playoff. If you have the score, tie breaks they have to be determined at the board. And uh, as it happens at this point in the game, as far as we know, unbeknownst to Alareza, he has because of the result on another board, he now has no chance 
even with a victory, to be a, con a contender for first place. He has the score for it, but he doesn't have the tie breaks within their silly tie break system. Okay, so he doesn't know that yet at this point in the game, but he's about to find out. Okay, his opponent, Watacek, moves the king out of the way. The rook goes to f1, bishop to g8 to defend e6, king g2, rook d7, rook to f2, queen to b7, aiming the queen on that long diagonal, hitting the e4 pawn, x-raying against the white king, rook to e2 over defending e4, queen c7, bishop to a3. Here, uh, the move e5 was threatened, sort of undermining that c5 bishop, so he gets it out of the way. Queen goes to b6, piling up on the d4 pawn, these little threats. Bishop to b2 defends the pawn and also opens that long diagonal, or potentially opens that long diagonal with the bishop aiming at the king. Bishop to h7, queen to f4, bishop g8, queen to g4, aiming at the light squares. What a check piles up on d4. Bishop overprotects and also aims at the a5 pawn. Queen to c6, bishop to a5, takes the pawn. At this point, Borussia is completely winning this position. Right, so the game is, uh, as we say, all over but the crying, right? He, he, all that's left is the winning process. Rook to b8, queen to f4, rook d to b7, queen to e3. He attacks the h5 pawn. G4 defends the pawn, uh, but white's king is now a bit more exposed because he advances that G pawn. Queen to D7, and now the threat of E5, followed by queen takes G4 check, is in the offing. So he defends G4, but now queen takes D4. This grabs a pawn, but it also opens up that really long dark square diagonal we were talking about earlier for the white pieces. So the bishop come back, comes back to C3, queen to d1, and rook to d2. So, this is when time control was reached. And it's a debate whether or not Ferruja discovered this on his own or he was disturbed by the arbiters. At this point, the arbiters of the tournament told him and his opponent, Radoslav Odecek, that they literally had to move this game to another board somewhere else so the players that were competing for first place could take over their spot. Now, <laughs> I get upset when this happens to it would happen to me in a tournament, I'd be upset. I can only imagine what these, these elite players, how they feel, the intensity with which they play the game. I mean, this would be very upsetting. And Alareza was visibly upset by what happened. I mean, he he uh, really expressed his displeasure with what was going on. In fact, I think he even refused to move for a while. Now, technically, they say, and I'm sure they're right, that they, they, it was in the agreement for the tournament that this was going to, this was the process they were going to, to do. Agreement or not, the process, in my opinion, should not have been in place at all. Um, so here, clearly, Alareza was flustered by what happened, and it affected his play in a, a big way here. And uh, he has a hard time continuing the game. First of all, being asked to move, and now knowing he has no shot at first place, even though he's got the points. So queen to b1, what a check attacks the e4 pawn, queen to f4 defends that pawn, but also threatens queen takes h6 check. Remember that g7 pawn is pinned by the bishop at c3. e5, blocking that diagonal. Bishop takes, and now bishop takes c4, getting rid of that powerful light squared bishop. And after bc4, a draw was agreed. And before we talk about the fallout, uh, this might be what it would happen. Rook e8, say queen h6 check, king g8, queen to c6, and uh, rook b7, queen to d5 check. And um, this position is drawn. You put it in a computer, it's 0, 0.00. So, Alarez is clearly upset by what happened, um, as well he should be. So now it's this year's Tata Steel. So what happens? Well, Alarez, you know, they apologized, as they should have, and Alarez publicly accepted their apology. However, when it came time to play in this year's Tata Steel Masters, 
as I understand it, as reported from the organizers, they went to Alareza and offered him, or asked him to come and play, and he asked for a certain amount of money to come play. And that's standard practice. Um, you know, because these are top professionals, they have a certain amount of money they'll receive to go play at these tournaments. And apparently the amount of money that Alareza wanted was uh, far too much. And you get the impression that he was asking for an amount of money that he knew they couldn't pay. You know, sometimes you can get so angry at somebody that whatever they do isn't good enough simply because they're willing to do it, you know. So the only thing good enough is what you aren't willing to do, you know. The only amount of money that will be enough is the amount of money you aren't willing to pay. And because of that, uh, he did not play in this year's Tata Steel Masters, and it was a big loss for the chess world. Now, I, I ask you to comment down below, because um, this does sound a lot like Fisher in a way. Two differences between Alareza and Fisher. Fisher complained about much smaller things. This is a legitimate beef. He has a reason to be upset here. Uh, Fisher would complain about, you know, ticky-tack stuff. Another big difference is that Fisher was kind of his own person. He was all on his own. He didn't have much in the way of family support. He did have some friends that tried to help him out, some mentors, but he essentially was isolated and on his own. But Alareza has a family structure, a family unit. As I understand it, his father helps uh, manage his career. So you get the impression this might have been a, a team decision, although you only know if you're inside the camp. Otherwise, uh, you don't know. Um, but tell me what you think. Do you think he made the right decision? The wrong decision. Uh, this game is kind of a wound in a way in modern chess history. It it hurts a little bit. It's a, a a real lesson in how not to handle things at the organizational level. Um, and you know, we'll see what its impact is on the future of Alarez's career. It's a, an interesting moment in modern chess history, and I hope you enjoyed. Uh, reliving it, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. Goodbye.